Short period comets are proof positive that the universe, or at the very least, the solar system, is young. If short period comets were any older than 10,000 years old, the solar wind would have blasted them into nothingness by now. In a desperate attempt to save their precious concept of billions of years, evolutionists just made up something called the Oort Cloud as a way to replenish the supply of short period comets. Hearing this argument made me excited to see the kind of lengths the so-called scientists will go in order to save their theory. I just had to investigate. As I'm sure you're aware, comets are, astronomically speaking, very small orbiting bodies comprised of many materials. Each one has its own unique composition. What they have in common, however, is that as their severely elongated orbits bring them close enough to the sun, they begin to eject a stream of particles, commonly referred to as a tail. This tail is a stream of mostly water ejecting away from the sun regardless of what direction the comet may be traveling in. The cause of this gassing is not the solar wind, but the heat of the sun boiling the water on the surface of the comet. After the comet exhausts all of its volatile products, it continues orbiting the sun without a tail until it crashes, is gravitationally captured, or is simply ejected from the solar system. The lowest lifespan estimate for the shortest period comets known is 40,000 years, four times the estimate made by Kent Hovind, but still nowhere near 5 billion years. There are two distinct classes of comet, short period and long period. Short period comets are defined as those those with orbital periods of less than 200 years, while long period comets have orbital periods of greater than 200 years, even thousands or perhaps millions of years. Long period comets are also distinct in that they tend to orbit from virtually any direction in the sky, whereas short period comets orbit exclusively on the same plane as the planets. For this reason, short period comets are also referred to as ecliptic comets. In 1932, Estonian astronomer Ernst Opik presented his theory to the American Academy of arts and sciences explaining perturbations in the orbits of many different bodies in the solar system. His theory was not meant to explain the orbits, it was more of a conclusion based on the observation of long period comets. Opik's theory was revived in 1950 by Jan Oort when he noticed that Opik's proposed cloud would resolve the issue of how short period comets could still exist when by now the majority of them should have been dissolved or crashed into larger bodies like the sun or the planets. Oort noticed that the longest orbits of any comets extended out to a peak distance of 20,000 AU, or roughly 20,000 times the Earth's distance from the Sun. This is where he proposed this reservoir to be. In fact, the Oort cloud doesn't explain short period comets at all. The Oort cloud, as theorized, surrounds the entire solar system, explaining the vast directionality of long period comet orbits only. Soon after the discovery of then planet Pluto, a number of scientists, including Frederick C. Leonard and Armin O. Lauschner, began to ponder the likelihood of planet-sized bodies at greater distances. In 1943, Kenneth Edgeworth published a paper in the Journal of the British Astronomical Association which postulated that any such bodies would surely be coalesced solely into smaller planetoids forming a belt much like the asteroid belt. In 1951, Dutch astronomer Gerard Kuiper theorized the existence of a flat disk of trans-Neptunian objects including the planet Pluto. As part of this theory, he predicted that this belt of objects would no longer exist having either been drawn into the solar system system or projected out. In 1992, astronomer David Jewett and graduate student Jane Liu discovered the first object beyond Pluto. It was touted as the first object in the perhaps ironically named Kuiper Belt. Since then, thousands of objects have been discovered in the Kuiper Belt. Studies of the composition showed that they are comprised of the same materials as most comets. In January 2006, Paul Collis, James R. Graham, and Michael P. Fitzgerald, all from UC Berkeley, and Mark C. Clampin from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, Center published a paper in the journal Astrophysics. They discovered what appear to be Kuiper belts around at least two other stars. The Kuiper belt, however, is also not considered to be the source of most comets, actually. Most of the objects in the Kuiper belt are in a very steady orbit, so it is unlikely that anything other than a sudden and massive gravitational force would degrade their orbital paths. At the beginning of the 21st century, several objects were found within the orbit of Neptune. As more and more objects continue to be found, the eccentric of their orbits begin to resemble the orbits of short period comets. This field of hundreds of bodies overlapping the Kuiper belt was dubbed 
the scattered disk. But there appears to be a transitional body from scattered disk to short period comet. Further in between the planets Neptune, Uranus, and Jupiter are tens of thousands of objects known as centaurs. They are noted for having even more accentuated orbits that bring some of them close enough to the sun to form a tail. Since the postulation of the Oort cloud, our solar system has proven to be much more crowded than we could have ever thought. Within the orbit of Jupiter and even in the orbit of Earth are thousands of objects known as Trojans. Many objects in the asteroid belt are also similar in composition to comets. Although several objects in the vicinity of the proposed Oort cloud have been directly observed, there is no need to refer to it to explain short period comets with the severe abundance of sources in our local solar system. Like last week's episode, this story is still unfolding. Over the summer of 2015, humans were privy to some fantastic new knowledge and images of the dwarf planet Pluto. As the New Horizons spacecraft hurtles away from our solar system, it will have the opportunity to study at least two other Kuiper Belt objects. Each time we gain more knowledge of the universe, the creationist position gets that much smaller. And that's an astronomical example of how creationism taught me real science. Learn more about the real science behind other creationist arguments by watching other episodes. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may be the subject of a later video. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.